Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the visible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Lord, we do, uh, we praise you, Lord, for so many reasons. As we've sung, we especially praise you. We can say it as well with my soul. You have taken our sin. You've nailed it to your cross. We bear it no more. We bear none of the guilt, the condemnation. It's gone. It's buried in the depths of the sea and removed as far from us as the east is from the west. That you've taken it and promised it, taken it away and promised you will remember it no more. That we can simply rejoice in the fact that our sin is gone. And we thank you for that. The great hope and salvation we have as a result. And Lord, we thank you for your grace in answering our prayers in this life. Lord, we thank you for working in such a way in Ted's life and with the doctors. And Father, there's nothing, nothing wrong. There's no need to have surgery or any, any other treatments. And so, Lord, I pray, praise you for that. Just simply again say thank you. Lord, I'm mindful this morning, though, of uh, their pastor over there in Limestone with the pancreatic cancer, that you will minister deeply to Lyle and Sandy and that family, and that church family as well. Lord, as it looks like it's just a matter of time for Lyle, I pray that you'll give him grace that he may finish well, that he may glorify you all the way to the end. And Lord, that you will work in that church and show them, Lord, the hope of the Christian that through this cancer, Lord, many will come to know you. Lord, I do pray for this church here. Father, as we seek to serve you, not just when they gather, but in every aspect of our lives and ministries, Lord, I pray that you will be glorified. I pray that we truly will seek you first, that we'll truly make your, your glory, your will, supreme in every aspect of our lives and ministries. Lord, we do pray that you will work mightily here, that Christ may be lifted up, that you will draw many to yourself. Lord, that those in this community that do not know you, that they will see the gospel, they will hear it, they will believe and be saved. Lord, I, I think of many, again, that are on our hearts, many friends, neighbors, family members that do not know you. Lord, we ask that you will mightily work will pour out your Holy Spirit on them in such a way that they will be compelled to come to Christ, that they may receive him as Savior. And Lord, that you will, by your power, work in us, by your Spirit, work mightily in us, that we may go out to proclaim your gospel with boldness, with zeal, with compassion, that, Lord, you'll give us open doors to tell the gospel to those around us. Lord, we may glorify you in just our faithfulness and obedience to the Great Commission. Lord, we pray for our service this morning, that as we continue our time of song, as we open your word and continue to meditate on it, that, Lord, we will be continually being transformed to be like Christ, that our eyes will be lifted upward off the things of this world, that we may see the surpassing riches that are ours in Christ. And so, Father, we pray that in this time, you will be pleased with us. We do ask this in your Son's precious name. Amen. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, into blackness and darkness and tempest, 
and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What are the three rules of real estate? Location, 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 right? In this portion of Hebrews, the author is deeply concerned with the location of the members of the church in Jerusalem. He's not really so much concerned with the physical location or the property values of their home. He is concerned about their spiritual location. And so he draws for them a contrast between Two mountains. He sets one up and here says, look at this. And then says, now look at this. He draws for them this first mountain that they had previously inhabited. And then he shows them the second mountain that they were then inhabiting, or that they at least had professed to be inhabitants of. And the first mountain is Mount Sinai. And Sinai looms large over the Old Testament. It first appears in Exodus chapter 3 as a place where Moses kept his father-in-law's flock of sheep. In Exodus 3, that mountain is called Horeb. It's another name for it. It's also called the mountain of God. It was on Sinai where God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. And from that mountain, God sent Moses to Egypt to bring all of Israel out of slavery and back to Sinai. So three months after their exodus from Egypt, over a million people gathered around Mount Sinai. And at that mountain, God entered into an incredible covenant with all the people of Israel. So that God said in Exodus 19, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Sinai is seen by many as the place where the people of Israel became a nation. Before Sinai, they were a family, a tribe if you will. They were slaves in a distant land, all descended from the same father, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But at Sinai, they became a nation with civil and religious and criminal laws. At Sinai, they now were were made the unique people of God because they were the chosen people. They were given laws that were different from the laws of any of the other nations at that time, and any other nations in all of history, including today. Their laws were given to them directly by God. And their laws were given to make them a nation which worshipped and served Him only. They were truly a theocracy, a God-ruled nation. And they were a people set apart from all the other peoples in the world to God. And in preparation for the giving of this great law to Israel, God commanded the people of Israel to wash and to sanctify themselves because God was going to descend onto Mount Sinai and there He would speak to all of them. And so God commanded that not only they prepare themselves, but also that they set a boundary around the mountain, lest any person or animal come on to Mount Sinai. Any who touched that mountain without God's special permission were put to death. And so a few days after God gave them 
those commands to prepare themselves, God descended onto Mount Sinai. And I'm going to say this again. No other nation has seen anything like this. No other nation has had the visible presence of God descend from heaven to establish their rulers, their worship, and their laws. And Mount Sinai is a hill hallowed by the presence of God. And God condescended to descend to earth. And it's an awesome thing to think of that stooping downward to come to man. But when He did so, even in His shrouded glory, His majesty was overwhelming to earth and man. So Exodus 19 tells us when God descended to Mount Sinai, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. An incredible scene. I don't know if you can imagine and picture it in your own mind. God comes down to earth. And just that majesty and power displayed there is so great that all of the earth trembles beneath him. The trumpets blare this loud, triumphant sound to herald the arrival of the Creator of heavens and earth. And when God's holiness strikes the sin-cursed earth, the mountain ignites. Smoke pours up and blots out the sun. And the multitude there gathered around the base of that mountain shake in fear at the awesome display of the glory of the King of Kings. It's a terrifying spectacle. The Israelites were so filled with terror, they told Moses, you go talk to God for us. And they in fact begged him to not let God speak to them anymore. It was so terrifying. They said, don't even, you talk, you do all of that, we don't even want to hear his voice. And so Moses climbed Mount Sinai into the heart of the great cloud of fire and smoke. And there Moses entered the presence of God and was given the law of God written in stone by God's own hand. And Moses took that law down to the Israelites to be the rule of their lives, their government, and their worship. This law is more than just a set of rules. It was a covenant. It was a covenant between Israel and God. So God promised to bless Israel with prosperity in the land of Canaan to give them a long, peaceful life in that promised land. And to receive those blessings, Israel had to keep all the law. They had to keep all the Ten Commandments and all the other laws that made up the Mosaic Law. The rabbis have counted and have said there's 613 laws in the Law of Moses. Now, if you know anything about modern legal systems, that's not much at all. It'd barely be a class, one class for a lawyer. Um, but when you come to these laws and you realize that most of them dealt with the minutia of daily life, They weren't just the big laws governing what to do with a murderer. These were laws governing what you eat, what you wear, governing matters of work and of family. Many of them dealt in incredible detail with worship so that God gave Israel precise instructions of how many festivals to have each year. Who was to travel to Jerusalem to participate in those festivals. How much of their possessions each family was to give to support the temple and the government. 
what kind of animals or grains to offer as sacrifice, and then a great list of things that they must not do. So these laws were, were more about the individuals than the government. And the Israelites had to keep those laws every single day. They had to think all ab- about all of their decisions in light of the, of the Mosaic law given there at Mount Sinai. So they went to a store to buy clothes. They had to examine every tag to say, is this proper clothing for me to wear? They went to the grocery store to buy meat. They had to examine Every cut, is this proper meat for me to buy and eat? It covered every aspect of their life. And if they kept the law of God, the Israelites would receive the blessings God had promised. But if Israel refused to keep the laws of God, they would fall under the penalties also given in the law at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 28 lists some of the curse of the law. I'm not going to read all of it. It's it's a lengthy portion. But listen as I read one part. It says, But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of your God, to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket that's for bringing in the harvest, and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed you shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have, you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. And it goes on from there. And these are not just idle threats. They became the dreadful realities of Israel. Israel failed to keep the law of God and they suffered all of the consequences of disobedience laid down in that law. So when we go to Mount Sinai, we see the law of God promising great blessings and every one of those blessings being dependent on the ability of the Israelites to obey the commandments. That was the problem. Israel could not keep the law. They broke the law before God even finished giving it to Moses. Because he actually gave the law in several different parts. He gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Moses went back down to Israel and delivered them to Israel. And then Moses went back up on the mountain to receive the law in its fullness. And during his fifth or sixth week up on the mountain... The Israelites demanded Aaron make them gods. And so Aaron made them a golden calf and they worshipped that calf as if it was Jehovah who had delivered them from Egypt. They broke the second commandment less than two months after they had promised to be, to obey it. They could not keep the law of God. That's just one illustration. If you know anything about the book of Exodus and Numbers, you can, you can think through other examples of how quickly they disobeyed God. Even worse, even if they could keep all of the law, the law could never make them righteous. They could gain a territory, but the law gave them no promise of eternal forgiveness. 
The law offered them no salvation from sin. It offered them no home in heaven. It pointed them to those things, but the law never provided them. The law of Moses was a dreadful law. It was a burden carried by every Israelite that gave no hope and no righteousness. The law of Moses was an unkeepable law. Therefore, its promises were ultimately unachievable. Now, I do not mean, and please, I know I've said a lot of bad things. <laughs> Don't mean me, hear me to saying that the law was evil or bad. Scriptures is clear. The law was holy, righteous, and good. It was holy and righteous and good when it was used rightfully. When it was seen to serve its great purpose by showing all who tried to keep the law their need of a Savior who can take away all their sin. The law is a good thing, but was unable and is unable to give life. The law brings condemnation and death. And from the heights of Mount Sinai, the law glowered down at Israel, frowning at them in wrath and in judgment. Sinai's legal bulk weighed down the nation and threatened to crush them all the way down into hell. That's the first mountain. What he says there in Hebrews 12 is this Mount Sinai stands as a representation of all the law of Moses. That it stands there showing the overwhelming burden of the Mosaic Covenant. And it is presented to us and to those Hebrew believers in contrast to this other mountain. So let me very quickly mention what Hebrew says is, is the contrast, the Mount Sinai side particularly. Mount Sinai was a physical mountain. Men had been there. He says, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched. It, it was one you could go put your hands on. You'd go pick up a rock from. If we knew exactly which mountain was Mount Sinai, we could go there and we could take a rock off Mount Sinai and bring it back today. It's a, it, it is a tangible mountain. Moses walked on it. It, it could be seen and felt and it's set in contrast to another mountain. One which we cannot at this time see or feel. But is no less real than Mount Sinai. Another element of the contrast is the approachability of the mountains. Despite the physical presence of Sinai, the Israelites could not approach it. Any person or animal who crossed the boundary at the bottom of that mountain was to be killed so that none but a select few could come onto the mountain and live. Moses alone entered the glorious presence of God. On the other hand, Mount Zion, this other mountain, is not physically present, but it is approachable by all. So that none are restricted from entering it if they will come through the door. They have access. Mount Sinai is a terrifying mountain of darkness, whirlwinds, fire, blaring trumpets, and the deafening voice of God. Mount Sinai was so terrifying that even Moses himself was afraid to approach it. The other mountain, not so. It is described and presented as a mountain of rejoicing and of fellowship. A mountain of, of entrance to all and life for all who stand on it. And this contrast, even though I've mentioned it, that, that one side of it very briefly, is it's yet another exhortation to those first century Jewish Christians to turn, not turn back from Christianity to return to Judaism. Judaism was Mount Sinai. What they had been saved out of was Mount Sinai. When rightly understood, the Old Testament law is terrible and terrifying. 
And the attempt to gain favor with God by the keeping of that law is hopeless. The New Testament Christianity is a different story. Now, I am not saying that in the Old Testament, God is a God of wrath, and in the New Testament, God is a God of love. The New Testament gives severe warnings and threatens eternal condemnation. In fact, the last several verses of Hebrews chapter 12 does just that. It warns of the terrible judgment waiting those who refuses Jesus. God is the same throughout the entire Bible. He is the God of holiness who judges sin, and He is the God of love who offers mercy to all. He is always that, and has always been that. And those who place their trust in Jesus for salvation are brought to Mount Zion. Those Jews in the first century who heard the gospel believed that Jesus was their promised Messiah and their Savior. They were taken out from under the wrath of the law. They were taken out from under Mount Sinai and now placed upon Mount Zion. So they no longer stood under Sinai's menacing cliffs, but now they are able to walk on the pleasant plateaus of Zion. We come to this Mount, verse 22, Mount Zion. We find it is unlike Sinai. Now, Mount Zion was, was the name of a physical mountain in Israel. It was the location of a fortress that had been conquered by David and became known as the city of David. This eventually became synonymous with Jerusalem. If you want to be technical, Jerusalem makes up an area larger than Mount Zion. It includes Mount Zion and also includes the Temple Mount and other mounts. But it became synonymous with Zion or the city of David. So that when we talk about Zion, we're talking about Jerusalem. When you read that in the Old Testament, it's speaking of Jerusalem. Many times, the physical city of Jerusalem. It was a city that was and is still loved by many Jews. It was their capital. And while we today, we may have grave concerns about the goings-ons in Washington, D.C., would you trade Washington for Moscow or Beijing? We understand that if we, we lose Washington, the nation is lost. We understand that Washington, in some sense, represents what we love about our nation. It represents who we are. Even though we might have all kinds of problems with the political nonsense, it still some way stands in for us. To the Jews, the Jer- Jerusalem held and still holds a place of greatest importance. So that if Jerusalem is in the possession of Jews, then they have a land, a home, and a nation that is their own. So to give you some idea of how deeply Jerusalem was loved, listen to Psalm 48. It says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, On the sides of the north, the city of the great king, God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. Jerusalem is beautiful. It is the city of God, and the psalm psalm there says it is the joy of the whole world. That is the love that the Israelis have for Jerusalem. And to the Jews of first century Jerusalem, the people who received this letter of Hebrews, this is a poignant comparison. Because they have the choice to remain there in beautiful Mount Zion, the city that they love, or to return to awful Mount Sinai. And and I don't have time this morning to to look at all the said about... uh, Mount Zion. We're going to come back to some of these next week, but it tells us seven things about this glorious mountain. Let me just mention them, and like I said, I'll come back to several of them next week. First, Mount Zion is the city of the living God. Second, 
Mount Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem. Third, Mount Zion is the home of a vast throng of angels. Fourth, Mount Zion is the location of the church. Fifth, Mount Zion is the court of God, who is the judge of all men. Six, Mount Zion is the resting place of the souls of the redeemed. And seventh, Mount Zion is the dwelling place of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the one who covers us with his blood. Even that brief description is so much greater than Sinai. Before I start this, this list, working through it, I want to mention uh, one comment about Greek verb tenses. Verse 22. He says, But you have come to Mount Sinai. That word translated have come is in the perfect tense in Greek. And the perfect tense indicates an action that has been completed and never again needs repeating. It is a past accomplishment that continues to stand as a present reality. So part of what he is saying is in Christ we have already come to the seven great realities. He is not saying you will come to, but you have. They are yours. You presently hold them and they will continue to be held by, I would say, for you. And so though we do not yet physically experience all these realities, we do not experience any of them to their fullest, they are still completely true. So that we have already come to Mount Zion. One day our physical experience will catch up with these spiritual realities. But that separation of the spiritual fact from the physical experience does not make the spiritual any less true or any less genuine. We have come to Mount Zion. It is our dwelling place forever so that it is our present possession and also our future inheritance. And this Mount Zion, which is ours, is far greater than Mount Sinai because Zion is the city of the living God. Verse 22. Sinai was not the dwelling place of God. His glory dwelled in the tabernacle and after the temple was built, then in the temple. But he he, he did not dwell on Sinai. If you want to say he rested for a time there. But he never lived there. He never dwelled on Sinai. Mount Zion is the city of the living God. Mount Zion is the place where God dwells, so that even though heaven and earth cannot contain Him, His throne, His temple, and His courts are in this heavenly Jerusalem, this heavenly Zion. And when we come to Mount Zion, Zion, we come into the presence of God, into the city where our Creator dwells, so that right now, Our present possession is eternal fellowship with God. Right now, our present possession is unhindered access to God because we have been brought to Him and to His city so that we are now made residents of the same city in which our God resides. We have also come to Mount Zion, Zion where resides God who is the judge of all. It's verse 25. We've come to God, the judge of all. In Genesis 18, Abraham calls God the judge of all the earth. In Psalm 94, God is called the judge of the earth. In Acts chapter 10, we are told that God the Son will judge all men, the living and the dead. Revelation 20 presents a vivid scene a divine judgment. A great white throne appears in the heaven. Seated on that throne is one whose holiness is so terrifying that even the physical elements flee from his wrath. All of the unsaved are brought before him. He opens his books and examines each life one by one. 
before sentence is passed on each individual, another book is opened. And the name is sought in this book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And when that name is not found in the Lamb's Book of Life, they are cast into the lake of fire. And this devastating judgment continues until all of the rebellions of rebellious, unsaved humanity have been condemned. God sits on His throne as judge of all. Mount Zion is the place where God the judge holds His court. And we are now brought to that place. And it should be a terrifying experience. But it's not. It, it's a wonderful thing. Even though we've come to, we come to Him who, it says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Jesus Himself de- describes Himself as a stone that will fall upon rebellious men and crush them. And yet when we go to this God and we fall on Him and we plead for pardon and mercy, then He grants it to us. So we who come to Him in repentance and faith, we do not fall under His wrath. But we find that we do have mercy. We may come and see the frowning judge, but when we approach Him and we plead for mercy, we find He is our smiling Father. So we come to this one who is the judge of all and we come without fear. Not because we are not guilty, but because our guilt has been taken away from us. So that in the eyes of the court, we are not guilty. So that even though we may feel in our own lives the weight of our sin, that weight has been taken off of us and has been placed on another. So that we are forgiven. Our judgment has been paid. And when we come to Mount Zion, we come to the one who paid that judgment. That's verse 24. We come to Jesus, the mediator of the better new covenant. Hebrews has shown us over and over again that Jesus is better. Hebrews 9 and 10 show that Jesus is a better mediator because he brings in a covenant which is able to do that which the old covenant could never accomplish. Through Jesus' one death on the cross, he perfects forever those who come to him for salvation. Hebrews 5 and 7 show that Jesus is the better high priest. He is an eternal high priest who is living forever, interceding for the ones he saves. He is, because he is the eternal high priest, he is able to save eternally those who trust him. Is not Jesus so much greater than all that that is found in the old covenant? Is not the new covenant of His blood so much greater than the old covenant of sacrifices? In all of those sacrifices, there was never full forgiveness. There was never that easing of conscience. There was no assurance of eternal salvation. In the daily repetition of sacrifice, there was nothing but the unending reminder of guilt and sin. The new covenant that Jesus mediates, that new covenant promises their sins and lawless deeds and will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The new covenant of the blood of Jesus, the unconditional promise that God will never again remember your sins. That through the blood of Jesus, They are gone. And unlike the terms of the old covenant, you do not have to do anything to earn or keep the promise of forgiveness. God does not threaten His children with the loss of forgiveness. He does not require you and I obey 613 laws to gain the blessing of salvation or a home in heaven with Him. 
The promise of the new covenant and all the blessings of it are ours because all the work that needed to be done was done by Jesus. Because even if there was one single law necessary for salvation, every one of us would break it. No matter what it would be. But Jesus has perfectly kept and done all of the will of God. And then He offered Himself as the innocent sacrifice of God the Son, whose blood is able to take away all our sin. And so when we come to Mount Zion, we do not come to a law. We come to Jesus. And we come to Jesus, we find we have come to Him who saves fully and eternally. And the challenge of Hebrews chapter 12 is why would you go back? Why would you leave this glorious Mount Zion to go to some other place? Few, if if any of us, have come from Mount Sinai. I, I imagine most of us were not keepers of the Old Testament law. Most of us were worshipers of the modern Gentile gods. So it's not a question of us of leaving Zion for Sinai, but for some other temple of worship. Would you leave Mount Zion for the Hollywood Hills? For Wall Street? For cyberspace? For the red light district, for the theater, for the stadium, for the beaches of Florida, for the retirement cabin in the woods, for the hunting blind? Would you leave the the glories of Mount Zion to gain some thing here, whatever it is? Would you away from the professed faith in Christ to go back to the gain of some possession in this life? Would you, would you leave this certain salvation to cling to uncertain deeds or doubtful philosophies, dubious pleasures or disappointing possessions? Would you refuse eternal forgiveness for eternal wrath? And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about a profession of faith and abandoning that which you have said to go back to that which can bring nothing but death. Would you go from the presence of God, the fellowship of the saints, the joy of heaven, and intimacy with Jesus? Would you leave all of that behind? What Hebrews calls us to do is hold fast. Cling to Jesus. Do not let go of Him. As Hebrews 10 says, and I'm paraphrasing, is wrap your arms around Him and hold on and don't let go. Hold fast to Jesus. Don't let anything distract you from Him. Don't turn aside from Him in any way. Keep your eyes fixed on Him. Keep your eyes fixed on Him who is on Mount Zion. And who has brought you into eternal bliss. And never let go. Let's pray. Lord, we do come and I I thank you. Lord, even as we consider these, these exhortations. That if we are in Christ. That you hold us fast. And yet, Lord, I pray that we will be very careful. We'll be very careful that our profession not found, be found to be false. We'll be very careful to not let our eyes be turned aside and be seduced by the promises of this world and this life. Lord, we will keep our eyes locked on those promises that are already ours in Christ. Those things which are certainly ours, we may be just waiting to experience them, but they are, they are given over to us already. Lord, that we will hold fast to the faith. And so, Lord, glorify your name in our lives. Amen.